It's the 10 to 1 podcast with your host, Brad Oman, featuring Ben Conowitz and Nate Laux. And here's the podcast. What? Yeah. What are you doing? I'm excited, guys. Was it like an Adventure Time podcast now? I'm so excited to talk about my, my new favorite film of all time. Blues Brothers 2000. Wow. This film changed my life. Now, <laughs> I don't know if that's true. It changed. Oh, I'll tell you what. Ben's never been to a proper revival before, no. so I can imagine that he probably this was saved. spoke to me in a way that you hope no one ever speaks to you. Musically? <laughs> that you hope anyway, your worst enemy this is, doesn't speak you, to you. This movie has like a 43% on Whoa, Rotten Tomatoes. Slow down, buddy. And it shouldn't. <laughs> Let us get into it. This is terrible. Jesus. No, this is not the worst no. of the films we've watched. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not, it's pa- it I was, not its this pa- was, Yeah, this was not as bad as I remember. Because I remember seeing it a long time ago and thinking that it was pretty bad. But um, It's so, not good. All right, this is a Saturday Night Live before, review podcast. Yeah, before we dig into it, this, <laughs> we're doing uh, some... Some, some extra episodes of our Saturday Night Live podcast. Typically, we review new episodes of Saturday Night Live, recap the sketches, and talk about our, our favorite bits and cast members. Uh, but during the summer, when the show's on hiatus, we have been going through the movies of Saturday Night Live. Uh, we started last year. Uh, we were doing some more this year. Uh, we're, we're coming up on, on wrapping up relatively soon, and so we'll, we'll figure out where to go next. Um, we'll but- probably just watch them again. We did. Uh, <laughs> we did have a little bit of a, a mix-up slightly because not really. It's the same year. Yeah, it's the same year. So like initially, uh, no one corrected me because they assumed <laughs> that I know. Uh, but we did a night of the Roxbury, and it's technically out of order because that came out in the the back end of 1998, whereas Blues Brothers 2000 came out in February of 1998. Even though it should have not come out at all. So the last episode you heard about A Night at the Roxbury, we said Superstar was next, uh, and technically that would have been right, except we skipped Blues Brothers 2000, so here we are. And this is also not a Lorne Michaels film. This He has nothing to do with this, so... Like I, I feel like I was watching more Lorne Michaels involvement type of films. Yeah, Brad, why, why did we watch this movie? Hmm. Not really, a, not really an SNL produced movie. I mean, technically, the Blues Brothers movie isn't either, right? Lauren Michaels didn't produce the original, did he? Uh, no, but wouldn't it be... Uh, maybe he didn't, but like, wouldn't it be so funny if he did produce the first one and the second one he's like, nah, not, not put my name on that I'm, I'm one. I'm good here. Don't no. really think we need to keep the Blues Brothers going anymore. No, he did not produce the first one. Yeah, see? So there you go. So stuck on that. No, it's but, th- this but is I will featuring say this. A, 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 a character a from SNL, so I guess let, we're doing that. Let me say this, though. They are. It's an official Saturday Night Live movie. <sighs> Lorne Michaels was not really producing movies when the first Blues Brothers came out, and he was when the second one. And he chose not to be a producer on this one. But I wonder if, like, they they asked him, or if they just didn't need to because they yeah, had. It's produced by John Landis, Leslie Belsberg, and Dan Aykroyd. Yeah. So maybe they just didn't need to. And yeah, Accurate had that, all that Ghostbusters money. He's like, where do I just dump this into a passion project that only I want? I mean, it's funny you say that, but beca- but like honestly, it's it really is like a Dan Aykroyd passion. I project. know. Um, so Blues Brothers 2000. Had you guys seen it before we watched it for this never, podcast? No, nope. never seen it before. Okay, I I saw it around the time that it came out. I think I rented it on video, and that was the first time I had seen it because I I had already been associated with the Blues Brothers thanks to my dad. And uh, I was curious, and uh, at the time, the the idea of having a kid in it worked for me, because mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> I was a kid, and I was like, I'd like to be a blues brother. Um, it uh, it didn't work so well on adult bread. <laughs> yeah, it's very creepy. And let's let's be honest, the story for the original Blues Brothers is not anything like super compelling or intricate no. or you know um it's it's mo- much like this movie it's mostly a showcase for dan Aykroyd and john belushi to sing the blues with blues legends and do musical performances with a very loose story threaded in yep. between um this one uh I don't want to say it's less realistic uh, (laughs) because the first one isn't necessarily super realistic, but it being made in 1980 and having a much more grounded feel does make it feel like it's not quite as silly, but this has definitely a more fantastical lean to it, right, Nate? For sure, and and I don't know if you want to get into this now, but... This was also not the film that Dan Aykroyd and John Landis wanted to make. No, this they were actually kind of pushed around by the producers and the studio. Lorne uh, Lorne Michaels. They wanted to make a R-rated film like the first one. 
and they were and they were not allowed to. They yeah. wanted to, and maybe because the you know the studio saw somebody like you and said, "Hey, we got to put a kid in this because well, that's so that, how we're going to get new viewers to this brand." Yeah, well, because they definitely wanted a broader audience, and R-rated movies, you know, they they they, they were doing decently at this time you know if you had the right mix to make a good r-rated comedy but you're always going to get more money if you make a movie that's pg or pg-13 and so yeah one of the things that they did demand was they wanted a kid in the movie and so uh i have this actual this quote from john uh landis here because uh he talked about how even <laughs> we, we didn't want the fucking kid <laughs> i don't know why they had a fucking kid eh, in the movie. it's kind of a little <laughs> bit like that honestly <laughs> no so even even before belushi's death uh they had talked about a sequel to the Blues Brothers, um, and then so like what happened in the interim? Uh, here, what Landis says uh, this was in a, um, an interview with AV Club. Uh, We'd always intended for a sequel with John, but of course, when he passed away, it was obvious we weren't going to do it. But Danny had been performing with John Goodman and Jim Belushi and the band, and he said, "You know, this is great because the music is recognized now. Let's do a movie." I said, "Great, sure, okay." And we wrote what I thought was a terrific script. Then Universal Studios eviscerated it. That was a strange experience because the first thing they said was that it had to be PG, which meant they couldn't use profanity, which is basically cutting the Blues Brothers nuts off. The first movie is an R-rated film, but true. there's it's no true, nudity or violence in it. It's just the language. Yep. Then they said, you have to have a child. You have to have blah, blah, blah. The bottom line was the only way the movie was going to get made was to agree with everything they said. Uh, you know the difference between a brown nose and a shithead? Depth perception. That's the only time I ever really fought with a studio because they didn't really want to make it. So we did every single thing they said. By the time we'd done that, the script was kind of homogenized and interesting. Danny said it's about... Uh, it's about the music. It's just about the music, John. So don't worry about it. We'll get the best people. We'll make a great album and get these people on film. We have to document these people. Uh, he says, it's interesting because as much as I make fun of Danny, three or four of those guys have passed away since we made that movie. People say, okay, you've got Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles, James Brown, Cab Calloway, and John Lee Hooker and the Blues Brothers. Who's in Blues Brothers 2000? The answer, everyone else. The first movie has five musical numbers and the second movie has 18. So, it's ridiculous. So yeah, bit, so yeah. so this is a, was a movie that Dan Aykroyd really didn't care about the story and just wanted to showcase for blues music that he loved so much and that he wanted to perform, you know? And I think he probably thought it was enough to get people out, right? Like just just because I'm, they were touring, they would tour occasionally. I bet if the Blues Brothers would tour now, if Dan Aykroyd would go on, they would sell out, you know, different I'd go, venues. I'd go see him. I don't, I don't even love saying. blues music, but I would go see him just to see them before there's no other That's opportunity. What I'm so I think it could give you a false kind confidence that hey this is what people want we just need to put the music in there and people want to come and see it yeah and that's not what happened no yeah so this movie came out uh in february 6th of 1998 uh it debuted against the replacement killers uh which ended up in second place for the box office Pat. that weekend uh it was beaten by titanic in first place eight weeks into its saying, release how many weeks into it uh goodwill hunting was in third place 10 weeks into its release uh, but it did beat out uh, in the rest of the top ten. Great expectations, as good as it gets. Spice World, Wag the Dog, Desperate Measures, and Deep Rising. Oh, Deep Rising! <laughs> Isn't that the one with uh, Haley Joel Osment and Bruce Willis? That's and Mercury is, Rising. Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> What's Deep Rising? Deep Rising is, uh, I believe, it's a flood drama with. That makes um, sense. Gosh, who's in that? Uh, Deep, Skeet Ulrich. Uh, Deep Rising is Treat Williams. Oh, Candy Treat Williams Jameson, Kevin there O'Connor. Go. There you go. Yep. Um, I also looked up uh, the 1998 films, because this is released in 1998, Yes, of the other comedies that came out, to kind of gauge a little bit sure. where comedies- 90, 98 was a big comedy So year. Something About Mary? That was the number one yeah. comedy 100%. of that year. It was the number four overall for Box Office. This is from Box Office, box office Mojo. Um, another f- other, well, other comedies that did well that year, let's yeah. say. The Waterboy. Of course. Sure. What's your what's your take on the Water Boy? Do you I, guys like, like? I like the Water Boy. It it still falls in the pantheon of the early Sandler stuff that yeah. I still like. That was like the yeah. last one. I think Little Nicky kind of jumped the shark for me. I need to do a rewatch of Little Nicky. I didn't. Uh, need... Big Daddy, I think, came. I loved Big after, Daddy. So... Did it? Yeah, I yeah, want to say ninety nine. Yeah, I, I, like, I like. No, Big I still Daddy. like that one. Yeah. Little, you're right, though. Little Nikki is the turn. I think it really because like Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore and the Water Boy. All, all three of those are like silly young Sandler wedding just, singer, wedding singer for sure. But that's that's even that's just like a good movie. <laughs> like yeah. a lot of times you can you can say Billy Madison isn't the best movie. Oh no, ever. the quality of wedding singer is definitely up yeah. there. 
Mr. Deeds, did you guys like Mr. Deeds? No, I like parts that, of it. Yeah, it, see, he, he, yeah. Every, I, I don't know. That's, why, that's Mr. when Deeds he, is one of those things that just I don't know why I like it, but it's not a good film. It's but when, like that's it. when he started to get a little too silly for me, and like he, I think if it, it felt like he didn't care as much about the story and just wanted to do bits. Yeah, and. It, it is weird, right? He's got uh, crazy eyes, you know, Steve Buscemi driving a, a, all these Corvettes or whatever, mm-hmm. and he's got the John Turturro with the feet thing, just all these kind of weird things. And and then his character for the first time was it, it, from from then on, he's he's doing like a variation of like he, what is it, Hubie Halloween, yeah, or whatever, where it's like he's just like this really awkward, shy, like I don't know, I don't know, yeah, I'm, I'm Deeds. This is what I do. I'm just an, a normal, just a normal guy. guy that talks kind of quiet. It, I don't Which like is a that. remake of. But but yeah, I agree. But I, there's something about it though that I when I see it on TV, I'll often watch. You know it. what? I I think the difference is I I think that in Billy Madison, and in Happy Gilmore, and in uh, Waterboy, that's Angry Sandler. Yeah, I, and yeah. so when he's subdued and just playing the everyman, I don't I don't what like about that. But, anger management. But, but, but Deeds but Deeds does have moments where like he does like sure you know get, and that, and those are probably mo- the most yeah. funny scenes. But I mean when he's yelling at the top of his lungs in Billy Madison and in in Happy Gilmore, I'm laughing really hard. What about Fifty First Dates? 50, I, I like Fifty First Dates. Pretty good, uh, save for the stupid Rob Schneider bits. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I will say though that year Fifty First Dates came out. M- one of my favorite Sandler films. It's a it's a rom com, but I love this film. It's one of the first serious Sandler films where he gets a little more. He lets his acting chops come out. Spanglish. Did you guys watch Spanglish? I, I, like, Spanglish. I like Spanglish. I yeah. like Spanglish. A lot. Did you ever make the sandwich a... from Spanglish? I made the sandwich. They, it's in the DVD uh, bonus features. I've really? never made the sandwich, but it sounds delicious. They, they in the bonus features. There's a, a how to recipe, and I made it one. That's time. great. It's actually really cool. All right, back to that though. Let's talk about the films that came out that year because again, it'll get, give you a little bit of an indication of where comedy was at this point. So yeah, there's something about Mary, The Water Boy, Doctor Doolittle with Eddie Murphy. Oh yeah, that was a big one. Um, yeah, that was the number six that year. It in America alone, domestic box box office was 145 million, which yeah. is pretty big for a comedy. Yeah. Um, and then. Would you guys, this is a good question, would you guys consider Rush Hour a comedy? Yes. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah, Rush Hour was number nine, um, A Bug's Life. Uh, then we go down to some of the other Ants, Rugrats movie. Um, then The Wedding Singer uh, came out that year. There you go. And uh, that's uh, like then some family, mo- family movies, The Parent Trap, that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's kind of where a lot of the comedies were. Um Patch Adams, which is veers a little more into dramatic territory, yeah. but still has Robin Williams it bits. It still in has, it. yeah. But that, no, there's not a ton. I was, oh, you know what came out that year? Too? Tell me, A Night at the Roxbury, as we <laughs> talked about. <laughs> yep, it's true. Um, which made thirty million. So I mean, A Night at the Roxbury made thirty million. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's uh, double what Blues Brothers two thousand made. And you know, deservedly so, because this movie is worse than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, listen. You can. I definitely enjoy it. Les. You can tell tell me all day long that this movie doesn't matter because it's about the eighteen musical numbers and capturing those performances. I would. I want to see a documentary of the making of Blues Brothers two thousand way more than I want to see Blues Brothers two thousand. That's fair. I want to see how they got like Eric Clapton to come in and all these other people and why, and why well, Travis Tritt. Why? Well, you know. well, I mean that super group, the Louisiana Gator yeah. Boys. Like that's that's there's a, that's a crazy assembly a who's of who. blues talent. You got BB B. B. King in there. I want to see that. Yeah, you know, I want to see how and why they chose and who could, they couldn't get, who they could yeah, get. The, I the that. musical guests in this, if you if you haven't watched it in a while. Um, you've got Erica Badu, who actually is a character, but again, a, an incredible musician. You got Blues Traveler in this. You've got Lonnie Brooks, Eddie Floyd, Aretha Franklin, James Brown, Johnny Lang, Sam Moore, Wilson Pickett, Junior Wells, um, BB King, Eric Clapton, Clarence Clemens, um, Isaac Hayes, Doctor John, like you said, BB King, uh, Charlie Musselwhite, Lou Rawls. Paul Schaefer, actually. So Paul Schaefer, the music, connection right? for SNL, Paul Schaefer was the director of the music for this. And he was going to do the first film. He just couldn't get get, get the space to do it. And um, Yeah, that was scheduling. So the, this movie is actually the first time that Paul Schaefer actually plays with the Blues Brothers band on like uh, in, in the, the franchise. Steve Winwood, uh, Jimmy Vaughn, Travis Tritt. Yeah, there's just 
a who's who yeah. of musical artists. The only person that didn't come back from the first movie, as far at least the ones that, that were dead. alive, yeah. was, was Ray Charles. And apparently he wanted a bit more money than what the producers could afford. <laughs> and so is that, is that right? Yeah. And so so he didn't do it. Um, but they, they did have a little nod to him because they uh, in the, early on in the movie, they drive by uh where the low actual location that was ray charles's like place that they went to in the first movie but it says uh ray's has moved yep i saw that yeah yep uh so so this movie comes out in february 6 1998 um up leading up until that previously the last appearance uh of the blues brothers on saturday night live do you guys know when it was probably to market this film no really? actually funnily enough the Blues Brothers episode that came along with the movie happened the Saturday, the weekend of release. Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't remember, but I know they did one in the 90s, but I don't remember. So, uh, 1995, the March 25th episode, John Goodman hosted and joined the Five Timers Club. Uh, for his monologue, Goodman appears as Mighty Mac, uh, and his uh, that's his Blues Brothers persona, and they perform Flip, Flop, and Fly. So a weird thing about this episode um, is John Goodman actually couldn't really properly be there at the show until Saturday because of a scheduling conflict with Roseanne. What? Yeah. What? They and normally really figure that shit out. Trust me. Yeah. And so if you uh, watch the episode, I went and looked back at some of it. Uh, Dan Aykroyd is a very prominent guest star in it, and he appears in, in more a, than lot, a lot of the sketches. John Goodman is still in a lot of sketches, um, but he's not in the pre-tapes, and he's uh, there's a couple that he's he's not in that they let Dan Aykroyd you know, play, play around in. As an aside to John Goodman, as we're probably going to talk more about him, I listened to his interview on Smart List. Did you guys listen to that one? Is it new? It's newish. Newish. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I did. I'm sorry. The, I did. I love that listen, guy. I haven't listened to it he, yet. He is a he's, national treasure. He's now sounding older, kind of like Tom Hanks. Yeah, he is. You know? But also just humble oh, yeah. and just a good guy. Yeah. And he is one of those actors that I I love dearly. And when they die, I'm going to be sad yeah. for a day or two because he, they. I do remember that episode now because. Talk about humble. He was willing to talk about everything. Yep. He was willing to be very effusive with with praise for other people the yep. whole time. Yep. And talking about uh, the, the Cohen brothers. brothers. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how much he loves them, but also how he they love they allow him to kind of be yeah. him. You know. Yep. And they wrote the Big Lebowski for Correct. him. Yep. Or, you know the character. Did they talk about the Flintstones? No. No. Okay. Well. No. no never mind. I'm but he probably would have if he, he yeah they would have asked. Yeah. Why are they asking the good questions on Smart Well, you know, if you get John Goodman on, on Hot Ones, they'll probably ask a Flintstone-related question. No, don't, don't put him on Hot Ones. You'll kill him. <laughs> <laughs> We're just talking about him. We don't want him to die. I, yeah. do, I do love Hot Ones. So, so uh, love Hot this ones 1995 so episode of SNL also features a fascinating crossover uh, and a weird mix of some meta comedy as well. Ooh, so, so go this, on. <laughs> so, this episode has uh, a new Superfan sketch. The Superfans famously the Bears, you know. Uh, that not only features an appearance by Irwin Mainstay, that's Dan Aykroyd's character who sells dangerous toys, oh, wow. uh, but it also has a joke where Chris Farley's character goes on a rant about the drop in quality of SNL, including a joke at his own expense about the fat guy that's screaming all the time. <laughs> and this happened because this same week is when that famous New York Magazine article came out where the headline was Saturday Night Dead. And was about uh, how SNL was just dog shit and like it wasn't as good as it used to be anymore, which happens at least you know once every decade. Right. Um, but that one was a very famous one when it came out. It really took shots at a time when like it f- seemed like you know it had a good cast going and, and things like of that nature. So. so you guys are watching or listening. Sorry, you are listening to the Seth Meyers and the Lonely Island yes. uh, podcast as well. And Seth Meyers has a theory where there is not just one golden era; there are golden eras. Oh yeah. And he talks about he has, he has not named them. I'm 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 only eight or nine episodes in. Um, I think the last episode of this dude came out in June seventh or something. But um, uh, would you agree there are golden eras? And what would you say they are? Probably. I mean, the original cast is going to be your first one. Because you have they, to. You name have them. to. That this this They defined right? the show. Um, yeah. Then you got you've got a, a lull before Eddie Murphy. But then you got when, the Dick Abersole years. Yes, but but then when Eddie Murphy hits, the, when Mister uh, uh, Mister Roger, Mister Robinson, sorry, Mister Robinson's neighborhood, and Gumby. But, it, it, but but is that is that 
a cast like because again he's talking about where the yeah I don't yeah I don't know if that's a golden era I think, I think that's just Eddie Murphy being great and like I make, think that's making, enough that's to, what I'm for me though it's enough to call it a golden era like that, I that, that like two, I don't two, know what, was he on there for a year yeah I, but I don't even I don't even know if it's yeah like so a, is that an so era yeah. an era I don't know uh, after that I would say uh, early '90s when you get Mike Myers and Dana Phil Harvey, Hartman Phil Hartman. John um, Lovitz. Late, late 80s, late, that, like 89 to like 94 years. Late 90s into early 2000s when you get Will Ferrell, uh, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, Maya Rudolph, all those people. And then like Seth Meyers talks about in the podcast, you definitely have one when Lonely Island starts gaining notoriety and you've got you've got a good cast there. That's Will Forte, Bill Hader. Um, so that's a mid aughts or mid. I basically yeah. think that about every late, every late seven aughts. years or so, yeah. it just seems that you get a good run of like three or four years. When of like is an the incredible... last golden era then? When Kate McKinnon left. So the Cecily Strong, yeah. Kate McKinnon, yeah, eighty Bryant, eighty Bryant. You think that's a golden era? I really yeah. do. Beck Bennett, yeah. Com- 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 Mooney, Beck Bennett. Yeah, because was... those none of nobody there has gone on to their own acclaim necessarily, right? Like nobody right. in that cast, maybe Kristen Wiig, is she in that or no? But I think Kristen Wiig left before that. She's in the Will yeah. Ferrell, because she's almost yeah. a tweener. A yeah. Well, bit, and that's but... the thing, like that you've got these these kind of crossover people because like Bill Hader left later. Yeah. Because he was, I mean, Stefan's character it was, was, you know, and Seth Meyers was still on the show. Right. That... Is and by that there. point, Seth Meyers was the solo anchor. Exactly. The so I don't know. I mean, it's, so, yeah. it's really hard to define these things. But I just I, picked a, a two, uh, let's say, season 42. This is in 2016, 2017. Is that about where you're talking about? Yeah, that would have been with Bobby Moynihan, Cecily Strong. Uh, you would have still. Uh, yeah, I'll give, you the, I'll give you the players. So you've got Vanessa Bear, Beck Bennett, A.D. Bryant, Michael Che, Pete Davidson, Leslie Jones, Colin Jost, Kate McKinnon, Kyle Mooney, Bobby Moynihan, Cecily Strong, Keenan, Shashir Zamata, Mikey Day, Alex Moffat, and Melissa Villasenor. I mean, I think that's a great, great. Do you think great, that's a great, golden? Great, yeah. yeah, I think that's solid. That's a very solid era. They did some really good stuff there. Um, so circling back uh, to Blues Brothers 2000, because that's what's important here. Uh, just any era, uh, Nate, that has the most evil scientists with The Rock, that's going to be a golden era in and of itself, okay? Because it's the best, it's one of the best sketches of all time. It's fair. Uh, so, Blues Brothers 2000 uh, was originally intended to include Brother Z Blues, which is, would have been Jim Belushi's character. Uh, however, he had an existing television deal uh, for an ABC drama called Total Security, that famous show that you all remember. Yeah, where uh, he played a, a schlubby uh, security guard with a hot wife. Well, this is a drama. So a schlubby police officer with a hot wife. Oh, sure. No, uh, he played uh, Steve Wegman. You you remember this one. <laughs> <laughs> Steve know, Wegman, James Reamer is in this, Deborah Ferentino. James Reamer, good actor. <laughs> um, There's literally, uh, wait, wait, wait. There's one person I recognize, Jason Biggs is in it. Of course he is. Oh, of course he is. Uh, so, yeah, so he uh, wasn't able to do it, but I guess it kind of worked out, at least Dan Aykroyd thinks so, because the original script, when the Jim Belushi's character was involved, basically was a retread of the original Blues Brothers, where they were trying to raise money to save their orphanage right. again. Uh, and so after that, they redid the script, and they started focusing on uh, what would have been Cab Calloway's uh, illegitimate son. Uh, played by Miles Dyson. Yeah, Miles Dyson. Who would have thought that the almost creator of Judgment Day would have been such a great blues singer? <laughs> but here we are, and it, it is really him singing too. Um, and funnily enough, so they did do a tour, uh, Blues Brothers, after this movie came out, and Dan Aykroyd wanted Joe Morton to come on tour with them because he could sing and he liked, you know, uh, performing with him. Uh, but Joe Morton uh, wanted to focus on his acting career and didn't want to have to like balance singing and yeah also he was like ah you guys might only be caring about the music here but this was a dog shit movie that i was in i have to save my career now i mean he got a paycheck i'm not sure he had much of a career after <laughs> blues brothers 2000. can you name another yeah. joe well, yeah, movie be- because of oh blues brothers 2000. i see interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's kind of like proving the point i don't know i mean after this movie he really I mean, didn't have I, a career uh joe martin was um uh aside of this in Justice League, he was the dad of. Uh, oh, that is true. Yeah, right. Another character who dies. Yeah, <laughs> really has a lot of comeback here. Um, so he's also you, an American gangster. Did you, did you guys see that film? I did. I did. Yeah, he was in that. Um, do you know uh, before the 1995 episode where John Goodman performs with the Blues Brothers, 
When was the last time the Blues Brothers appeared on Saturday Night Live before that? Oh, is that like mid-80s? Go back. Early 80s? Go back. Really? Was only Late in 1979? 70s? Like the, the last appearance the Blues Brothers made on Saturday Night Live was November 18th, 1978. Wow. Uh, they performed several songs, uh, and this was an episode hosted by Carrie Fisher, who would go on to star to in, the, in the movie. And and also die. And Thanks also for die. bringing that yep. up, Nate. I just wanted you to know she's dead. A lot of dead people. Yeah, like three decades later, <laughs> <laughs> Carrie Fisher died. Of a cocaine overdose. Wow. That's that is not, not even true, true at all. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Sorry, Carrie Fisher. Oh, my God. Um, so uh, so even though Miles Dyson did end up playing uh, <laughs> uh, Cab Calloway's illegitimate son, originally John Landis wanted Charles S. Dutton for the role of Cab. Uh, and if you don't know who that is, he's best known for playing the janitor in Rudy. Uh, by the is way, is he best known for that? What do you think he's best known well, for? Golly, because he's I mean, great he's in, in that. everything. Prove what? I'm waiting. You're five foot nothing, hundred pounds, and you you hung out with all these athletes. Five foot it. nothing, hundred nothing. Yeah, you got to get it right. Uh, he was also hey, he was also in a time to kill. He was. That's true. Time. Yeah, as, uh, and as he didn't even remember. And he's all like, "It was that what he's best known for." Are you doing Bill Cosby? No, I'm doing Dumb Ben. You just did a Bill Cosby. What hey, about? Uh, do you know what what Charles S. Dutton's known for? <laughs> the Charles S. Dutton. He's the, the Jello pudding box. <laughs> By the way, uh, I've seen two Alien films. Yes, you have. And he's in Alien Three. I've not seen him in that. Oh movie. yeah, that's okay. You're not missing much. Though. One day though. Nah, nah don't worry about. it. Gothica? He was in Gothica. Oh, with Halle Berry. That's is that true. Who was in Gothica? Halle yeah. Berry is the yeah. lead in Gothica. She yeah. plays came out, Gothica. Came, came out in 2001, right? Uh, Gothica came out in 2003. Close. Wow. Close, though. Um, so uh, I have some, some fun trivia. Okay. About Blues Brothers 2000. Uh, so you know, the big scene where he lists all the blues performers that like they would be doing a disservice to if uh-huh. they don't go on. Yeah. The name at the end, he says Robert K. Weiss. And they're like, who the hell is Robert K. Weiss? Uh, he's actually a producer on the film, and he's the reason that Dan Aykroyd and John Landis didn't quit the movie. Oh. So that's a little, a little fun bit of trivia Was there. it because of... The back and forth with the studio and them wanting to change the film. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, they were just getting really annoyed with all of that. Um, obviously, several cast members, other cast members from the original film, uh, reprised their roles. Do you notice who the first one is at the very beginning of the movie? No, you don't know who the warden is. Oh yeah, it's Frank Oz. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, idiot. Jeez, I don't know. I mean, just you know. Now, Ben, when we recorded the Blues Brothers podcast, you famously. We're very upset because you got the information wrong about how many cars were wrecked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I talked to Ashley about this last night when we were watching the movie. Interesting. And I was like, I got all upset because I had this thing and da 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 because it was fucking booking cars. But yeah, so then I just kind of put it out of my mind and I'm not, I didn't count this one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care anymore. So uh, this one actually broke uh, a Guinness record. Because- I told her that. Yeah, because the, they crashed 63 cars in the pileup uh, after he says, don't look back, and that was a new Guinness record. And the other record they set is they wrecked 104 cars during filming, which beat the previous record of 103 cars wrecked during the making of The Blues Brothers. Yep. Uh, and it would not be surpassed until G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra in 2009. Classic. Apparently, Love that one. they wrecked 112 cars. So there you go. Remember that. Do you think... I read that uh, Macaulay Culkin was considered for the role of Buster. I also read that. Do you, do you think this would have been a better film with Macaulay Culkin? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he would have been adorable and fun, you know, and it, w- it would do have Do you think been... this would have been more commercially successful? That's possible. You know, I'm not joking. I think that it it's tr- it would have been, no, no 1998, offense. Right? No offense, kid, but that would have, you know... He's not bad though. The kid's pretty good he, in the yeah, movie. He's fine. He's especially. He, There's no purpose for his character to exist in the yeah, movie. Exactly. Yeah, but but like the kid's not bad in the movie. Uh, funnily enough, the kid also played uh, Tum Tum in Three Ninjas Kick Back. Which I'm, <laughs> no, but I'm I'm gonna guess because Brad, you're a couple years younger than us. You probably did watch the Three Ninjas. Films, you bet your right? fucking ass I did. <laughs> I didn't. Ben, did that you was, watch? No, yeah, that that was was three too. Ninjas. Three Ninjas Kick Back. Three Ninjas Knuckle Up. I was not in for High Noon at Mega Mountain because I was too old <laughs> and I did not need. Because Brad was.
was 17. I don't need Hulk Hogan anywhere near my Three Ninjas franchise. What is going Not on Not my right Three now? Ninjas. What is going on right now? You said words there I that just, I've never heard I before. Just, I'm sorry. You've never heard of Three Ninjas High Noon at Mega Mountain? I have never heard of Three Ninjas <laughs> High Noon at Mega Let Mountain. Let me tell you, if you thought Beverly Hills Cop 3 didn't have enough action set at a theme park, Three Ninjas High Noon at Mega Mountain is here to deliver. With Hulk Hogan, with Hulk Hogan as, the, as, the as the villain. Of course. Yes. You will you will laugh. You will not cry. It's not an emotionally invested movie. Uh, but it is it is a real treat of dog shit. <laughs> hey, uh, Lonnie Anderson's in that one, and she was in the last film we watched for this podcast. That's true. Lonnie Anderson was in A Night at the Roxbury with her big fake boobs. <laughs> um, so here, I'm not, I, here's the <laughs> with fun. With her <laughs> big fake boobs. Moving on. Um, here's some a bit of trivia that I don't know if this is true or not, and I like the only way I think that you'd be able to confirm this is to actually ask Dan Aykroyd because I couldn't find this information anywhere else. I'll ask him except for IMDb. I'll call him. So IMDb's trivia question uh, tr- section says Dan Aykroyd had written the role of Mac with Chris Farley in mind as the two became friends during filming of Tommy Boy, and because Farley idolized Belushi, who played Jake in the original Blues Brothers. However. Farley's recent stits in rehab for drugs and his general declining health forced him to turn down the role. So John Goodman approached Aykroyd and Dan, uh, John Landis for the role as Roseanne was in its final season and he was wanting to quit the series in season nine to focus on a film career. I don't know how much I buy into that because March of 1995, which is around the time that Aykroyd and Farley would have been friendly and figuring that out, is when John Goodman does appear as Mac in that performance on Saturday Night Live. So I don't know if that timeline matches yeah, up. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily match. Yeah. So I, I suppose there's always a, a False. Sh- there's always a chance that Aykroyd had considered him, like, before, uh, you know, and maybe it just didn't work out. And so, like, Goodman came along and was interested at the right time. But, you know, it just I don't know. The timeline feels like it's a little Man, bit Man, but if there. you want a movie where John Goodman sings in jeans... This is the film for you. <laughs> I but also, I mean, you see Farley sing in Tommy Boy, and oh, so sure. you could easily see him doing this probably. Oh, I'm, I'm and, not and saying he good. couldn't. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like you're disparaging Chris Farley as the man <laughs> is dead. <laughs> Why would you disparage Chris Farley? Well, he died of a cocaine overdose. Oh my god, there's no reason to trample on the man's white powdered grave. <laughs> Jesus. Um this movie was also rated number four in Entertainment Weekly's top twenty five worst sequels ever <laughs> made <laughs> what would you say for you guys are the worst sequels ever made jack reacher never go back that's definitely up there not these days for it's sure for what about terrible the matrix reloaded no no that's good yeah that's dumb that's a bad idea that, that's a bad call do you know what the movies ahead of blues brothers 2000 are on that list mm. i mean we're kind of doing that right now we're no no he's, he started about... at the bottom so don't listen to him oh. <laughs> no i, I mean i don't Oh, you, oh you, I, I would say I would say. Oh, were you actually reading off that, or did no? You just, I wasn't reading off that list. Oh, because the Matrix Reloaded is number twenty-five oh. on that list. Because <laughs> I, I don't love that film. Uh, you often, don't like, you often, don't like the, the highway scene. Uh, oftentimes, it's incredible. Matrix Reloaded is phenomenal. The problem with Matrix Reloaded is that it's followed up by Matrix Revolution, which people confuse, which as, ruins everything. Exactly. Uh, oftentimes the, on that I'm list on Reddit, people will ask this question: What's the worst? Um, um, one of the Batman, uh, Batman and Robin. Batman and Robin is number five, just below Blues Brothers two thousand. Okay. Uh, worst sequels ever, and like, I don't know, because there's there's just so many that like you can't count because they didn't get released on oh, 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 in the um, theater. You know, we're talking about theatrical. I know, releases. and that's why. Well, how long? My Girl it? Two. No, that's a decent movie. Actually. I've actually never seen it. Um, how's Macaulay Culkin in the second one? What about Stiff? <laughs> uh, dumb, dumb and dumber. Dumb and dumber, 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 dumber. dumber and dumber is on the list at not, number fifteen. Okay, dang it. Number three is Leprechaun: Back to the Hood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you're doing I mean, jeez. I mean, like, if you're going yeah, to like J- low okay, budget fine. films, J- Jason X. <laughs> yeah. Number Jason X is on there. Jason X fucking rules. <laughs> Uh, Where number he goes to space. Yeah, dude, that movie is fucking crazy <laughs> and fun. That movie knows what it is. Okay, That's, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, two, Caddyshack. Two. Yeah, okay, that, I, I will give you it. that. I will give you that. Number one, and I don't agree with this one. I think this movie gets a lot more flack than it rightfully deserves. Porky's two. No, Porky's two is number twenty-three. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, number one, Staying Alive. The sequel oh, to, Saturday, to, Night to Saturday Night Fever. And I think it only gets so much flack because it's such. 
like a completely different it. movie than Saturday Night Fever, and that that's not what people were expecting or wanted. Now, like Leprechaun Back to the Hood is technically like the fifth in a series. Right? It's, it's not. Yeah. It's not the sequel, right? It's like Leprechaun. So six. like, this, this is just sequels in general, not right. not part two. So what I was trying to say is, like, could you say The Godfather three then? And it's on this list. Yeah. Yeah. Number twenty. But the problem with that is, I disagree. The Godfather three, if The Godfather one and two didn't exist, is not a bad movie. It's just in comparison to yeah, those. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a best, bad sequel. One of right. the best, if not the best, film ever made. Exactly. It's, right? it's like, so hard. Like, I can't believe So even if it's a 50% on exactly. Rotten Tomato, it's, it's, it's. Yeah. The only Friday the 13th movie that made the cut is part eight Jason Takes Manhattan. Uh, see, and that's so funny because he punches off a boxer's head. Fair. Punches the head off the Pun- body off of a roof. Punches it clean off. I'm not joking. Clean off. Clean off. Punches the head. The head, Jerry. <laughs> the head. Oh my goodness! Uh, so yeah, there's those are some of the bad sequels that made that list. When is the last Leprechaun film? Cars two. They did a reboot like two years ago, I think. The le- Leprechaun. Ah, it's the Leprechaun. Gosh, I'm the Leprechaun. That's from our Wayne's World episode. Yeah. Um. Hey, here's a fun question for you. Cheaper by the dozen two. Did you ever play the Blues Brothers 2000 Nintendo 64 game? No. <laughs> no, I never played Nintendo 64. <laughs> what? Neither did I, I actually. I didn't know. What? No. Yeah, Gosh, I, you're old as I had fuck. A, I had a PlayStation. PlayStation came out after Nintendo 64. Yeah, because like, I wasn't a little kid anymore, Brad. You didn't need to be to play and enjoy it. You never played GoldenEye? No. No. Are you fucking kidding me? No. That's one of the best first-person shooters of all time. Yeah, we know what it is, buddy. Yeah, but know. you never played we're, it? Never no, played but it. we're adults now. Holy yeah. shit. Oh, we yeah, we're, we're, how you don't play video we're, games. We were, uh, we were riding, we were riding bikes. Games yeah, but I know you sit on your toilet and play mobile mashup or whatever the fuck it is. I don't play mobile mashup or What's whatever. mobile mashup? Actually, it, um, it's just a generic name for any of the games he plays while he's sitting on the I, toilet. But I, I actually don't have a game on my my phone. You have it on your iPad? I don't have an iPad, but... You have it on your Amazon. We were. Tablet. I don't. We, rode, play we games. rode bikes, Brad. We were. We were outside playing with our friends. First doing... of all, you haven't ridden a bike since '94. '93, <laughs> but yeah. We do the stick and hoop thing. That's what we do. <laughs> yep, stick and a hoop from the makers of Ball in a Cup. Uh, yeah, no. Nin- uh, Nintendo 64 had a Blues Brothers 2000 game. I went. Did and you wa- play it? No, God, no. I, I didn't even know it existed until I lo- was looking stuff up about the movie. I went and looked up some gameplay footage though, and it looked like garbage. <laughs> so weird. That they it did, did have that. great uh, soundtrack. Yes, a, a, a fantastic soundtrack. Um, honest and honestly, here's what I will say about uh, Blues Brothers 2000 as a movie: is the soundtrack is great. If you love blues music, if you like the soundtrack to the first movie, you, you find plenty to love here. Even the people who criticized the movie and didn't give it good reviews say that the soundtrack is great because you of have course. all these legends who are performing in it. They're doing uh, great songs. The the super group that we talked about in it is phenomenal. That's the to see. only scene that I actually hardcore paid attention to when I started seeing. BB King and Eric Clapton. I was yeah. like, "Oh, what's this?" And I was like, "Oh, this is what they're doing. It's yeah. like a, it's a who's who." So the, I, I was, and the song was great, and I listened and, and paid attention the entire time. Yeah, that was a great scene in this movie. Yeah, unfortunately, Eric Clapton's son was not there. Mm, wow. Oh, that got dark. Hey, guess what? I don't care because uh, go read about Eric Clapton. Yeah, no, he's a piece, he's a piece of, shit. of shit. He's a piece. Yeah, of shit. so yeah. fuck off, uh, Eric Clapton. Good You're guitar player. Though. Cool. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, good guitar player. I, I, I love Layla. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, funnily enough, full circle song about cocaine. We all love cocaine, don't we? Well, we know Carrie Fisher did. <laughs> oh boy, it's again not an accurate thing to say. <laughs> wait, well, she, oh, well wait, hold on, wait, wait, it's very accurate. She did love cocaine, yeah, but she did not die because of it. <laughs> I mean, no. What did she die of? Natural causes from the cocaine. Oh, Jesus, what did she die of? Cocaine, natural causes. Like she was. Was she, she doing? I mean, was she still doing cocaine? No, like, oh, she, she was like seventy. So long ago. There's a whole she book was, but, about it. But she was sixty years old. That's pretty young to die. Yeah, it's true. But she did a lot of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> you know how much cocaine wears on you? It's a lot. <laughs> it's true though. Ben would know. No. What? Uh, what happened? Have you ever done cocaine? No. Okay. No. I've smoked the marijuanas, but, no, but cocaine after has... the podcast, can we talk about? The oh, I'm, I'm 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 an open book, buddy. I've smoked I've smoked the ganja, done some edibles, but I've never done ever that. done ecstasy. Ne- ne- no, never done any other drug other than we, other than the marijuana. Yeah, oh. same. Yeah. I was too terrified when I was a kid. I got offered a bunch. Like, I've in always high been school. curious. Oh yeah, I mean, I I think that if if anything, I would um I would probably like to try m- mushrooms. 
at a certain point. Would you do ayahuasca? I don't see. I'd, I'd have to know more about it. I'm curious. I don't really know. I, are you really? Do you want to do one of those? No, like, I, major, just, I just want to know what it, Jesus. I just trips. want to know what it does to my mind. I want to know what it feels like. I mean, people like that do it are like I it know. opens up the I'm, world. I trust me. I know. I'm ready for it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm ready to be a believer. Um. So after Blues Brothers 2000, welcome to the 10 to 1, where we talk about opening your mind. Yeah, by the way, listeners, if you want to know what we're like outside of this podcast, listen to our Go Flicks Yourself. The these are the types of yeah, conversations. We, this yeah. is the, definitely the kind of conversations we get into. Uh, so immediately following Blues Brothers 2000 opening, like I said, uh, John Goodman um, hosted again. <laughs> they disavowed the franchise uh, and fe- ran away. February 7th, 1990 episode, John Goodman hosted. Uh, Dan Aykroyd appeared many times in this episode as well. Uh, and yet again, Erwin Mainstay made another appearance in this episode, uh, wow. appearing in a Judge Judy sketch. Bag of glass. Yeah, bag of broken glass. Uh, do you know the next time the Blues Brothers would make an appearance on Saturday Night Live after this? No. 2006. No. Much earlier, actually. 2002. Closer. It's 2001, right after September 11th, to bring America back together again. Yes. Actually, go. it's funny you say that. It's very close because it happened on November 3rd, 2001. John Goodman was hosting again. Uh, this is the first time that the Blues Brothers appear for weekend update commentary. Uh, I don't remember that at all. They're not wearing their black suits. They're actually wearing uh, what looks like post office attire with like uh, a trench coat and fedora on it that matches the color of post office uniforms. And they are asked to talk about their feelings on the then current war that was happening with America <laughs> at the time. What? Yeah. And so like Dan Aykroyd has this like fun Elwood Blues long tirade about it and Mac is kind of like back up and, and things like that. Because that is something that Elwood is known for in the movies. Exactly. Going these on these crazy specific military uh-huh. tirades. Exactly. So they did use That's that. That's fair. That's fair. They use that um, and they they ba- basically use it as a way because one of the things Elwood says is, is like we're not going to, uh, uh, our Americans aren't going to change their way of life. You know, that kind of thing. It was very much like a lean into patriotism sure. moment. And then they perform um, the letter by the box tops in their garb. And what's, what, what's kind of cool about it is actually is you see them completely disassemble the Weekend Update desk nice. on the main stage to go into the performance, which, cool. which was pretty cool to see. Um, the next time the, and the last time that the Blues Brothers have appeared on Saturday Night Live was February 15th, 2015. Do you know why that was? 2015, uh, was it like the 40th anniversary of Belushi's death? It was the 40th anniversary of Saturday Night Live, period. Oh, okay. It says he saves the 40th. Yeah, yeah. the big, the big celebra- uh, celebratory episode they did where everybody showed up. Uh, they perform Everybody Needs Somebody at the very end of a comedic music melody featuring a bunch of other cast members doing their impressions of various people where they had performed God, songs just, from the it show. It just makes me think I'm so excited for 50. I know, right? I it's gonna be. Wait. It's going to be huge. It'll be fine. Oh wow! Yeah, just a real nitpicking Nancy over there. <laughs> um, just, just everybody's gonna come back, man. You're gonna get like, like, like Conan and Tino will write for it, and uh, it's just gonna be. Will great. they though? Yes. Yeah, of course. So obviously the Blues Brothers. Shut sound- up, Nate. The, <laughs> <laughs> the Blues Brothers soundtracks are are very big. They're best selling albums. Like they were yeah. huge when they came out. Uh, the Blues Brothers, or at least this is technically the Blues Brothers, also appear on two other soundtracks that are not Blues Brothers <gasps> movies. Ooh. Ooh. Do you want to take a guess which movies feature Blues Brothers songs on their soundtracks? Oh, jeez. Uh, I'll say Caddyshack Two. Wrong. No, that's a good guess. Mm. Porky's two? No. Okay, those are my two guesses. Uh, Na- uh, ben, you were very familiar with one of these movies very recently. Uh, okay. I know this for a fact. Yeah, that's not going to help. So think about who else was oh in- Oh my God, no one cares. Who's, like, in, who's in the Blues Brothers? A lot of people, Brad. But no, one of the main actors. <sighs> Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> Correct. Gross point blank. No. <laughs> who else is in the Blues Brothers that's not John Belushi? Oh you love this when he just like, so give me the answer! Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Who's a famous, don't care right famous now. comedian? They're also <laughs> past. Another hint, another hint. Give him another hint. A tribute to this actor is at the beginning of Blues Brothers 2000. Give him another hint. Another hint. His name is Sweet As. Go ahead. John Candy. Yes. Great Outdoors. There you go. That's one of them. Okay. And what's the other one? I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a hint. Dan Aykroyd has a penis on his nose. I don't know. Nothing but trouble. Yeah, nailed it. Wow. Yeah, the, uh, they were credited as. Have the- you ever seen that, Nate? No. Oh my God. 
Such a weird movie. It's a fucking weirdo show. Like, that movie should not exist. Dan Aykroyd has gross prosthetics on his face to make him so look many like, people like a decrepit old man. have gross prosthetics. And they intentionally made the tip of his nose look, look like, like a, a shriveled penis. dick. Nothing but trouble? Yeah, yeah. Chevy Chase, it's basically like- Demi Moore. Demi Moore and Chevy Chase get lost as a, as a couple- and they like get trapped in this crazy oh. creature. It's like, like a it's like a monster horror. version of Clue almost. Yeah. Directed by Dan Aykroyd, written by Peter Aykroyd. So they were they were probably so high <laughs> when they wrote this. It's it's crazy. This is, this must be a great film because the budget was forty five million and it made eight point four million. Yeah. One of those yep. big hits. Yeah. <laughs> one of those one of those massive hits. But yeah, the Elwood Blues review, uh each had a, they had a song on each of those soundtracks. This movie's not good. The the music is fine. Um, I was watching it. They they Erica Badu turns them into uh, voodoo green skinned monsters. Yeah, that's a very it just that's weird where weird scene. I mean, well, it, it, it wasn't great before that. I was just kind of losing interest, and then, and then that I'm happened. Like, I was like, I'm done with this. I can't. This? Yeah, this, this is doesn't... not fun. Well, in ge- is... in general, it just got a little too. It's bo- it's just too silly. Too, uh, too, too fantastical. Like I said earlier, like like when he, when he, when uh, when Miles Dyson shoots up into the air, right, and and it has all the sparkly stuff around. I mean, I understand, okay, that there's some fantastical elements, of course, even in the Blues Brothers, yeah. But this is just stupid, but not it like just, that, yeah. yeah. And this also, is not Conehead. Well, and yeah. especially the thing that frustrated me, and this is one of those things where like I like sound logic in my 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 yeah. comedy and my sketches. Is so they have to go audition for this mm-hmm. this you know voodoo mama person whatever. Who did they beat out? That there's only one other band there. I wasn't even thinking about that. <laughs> but so but the other thing is they they're supposed to audition to see if they're good enough. Their audition is controlled by the voodoo woman. Yeah, like she makes them perform it with magic. So like that's not them doing the performance. Listen, there, there's and then a she's lot. like, you know what, you're in, and it's just like, well, I would hope so. After that, there was a lot. Uh, so the movie starts with Dan Aykroyd getting out of prison 18 years later, and he stands on the side of the road waiting for Jake to come pick him. Oh, you know what? I'm glad you brought that up because I actually think that that is a really touching way to begin the movie. So that's what this was my point. I love the beginning of this film. Yeah, because it is so Blues Brothers. Yeah, yep. Dan Aykroyd stands there, stands there silently overnight. They cut back. It's the morning. He's still there. Yeah. How long has he I been wanted, there? I wanted something to be emotionally so resonant after that, good. and they just kind of dropped it. Like, so Frank Oz comes out and basically whispers, and you yeah, can't yeah. even hear the dialogue, but all you see is Frank Oz touch him on the shoulder saying, I'm sorry, as the warden yeah. to Elwood. And then Dan Arcord looks down, yeah. right? And then right after that, a Porsche. Miata, Porsche, 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 whatever, comes up, and she smiles, right? But then it cuts awkwardly, mm-hmm. and then... And it's by the way, it's this is one of those logical things, Brad, that I fucking hate too. That was daytime, right? Mm-hmm. Now they cut to the very next scene. I mean, it's an awkward cut, and it goes right. It's nighttime now, yeah. So meaning they have been driving for hours, and then she says, "Oh, by the way, here's who I am as a person." Yeah. Meaning they've driven for at least four or five hours the whole day, <laughs> yeah. And this is the first time she's explaining who she is. I hate when movies do that. Yeah. Shit. Um, Can you imagine writing just silently yeah. for six hours, then and then me. sparking that kind hey. of. You, you've been <sighs> together for you know so four hundred miles. Clearly, I wanted you to know this is who I am. They spent the budget on crashing the cars yeah. and on the musical talent in the film because there are so many fun things that you just notice about the filmmaking process. There is a scene in one of the cruisers where they print out the APB for, look, for looking for Dan Aykroyd, yeah. and it's literally just the actress pulling a sheet of paper up. And the printer noise is ADR after the fact, <laughs> and, da, 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 and she's just slowly like pulling yeah. the piece of paper. Up. I rewound it three times to watch it because it's not straight. She kind of yeah. pulls it out weird. It's like, oh my god, that's so bad. Um, I, I it's been so long since I'd seen this movie. I actually was thinking and hoping that John Papa and Blues Traveler yeah. were going to show up as their competition yeah. at the That'd thing, because that would have been really fun. Yeah, instead, uh, Elwa Blues is just a fucking asshole. Yeah, right? And he's like, yeah, no problem. We're going to take, well, be over there in a minute. Why don't you go over there and get started, and I'll be over there. And then before John Papa and the Blues Traveler band gets out of earshot, he goes, let's go, or whatever he <laughs> yeah. says. We're, we're leaving these dumb chuckle fucks. <laughs> it was like, whoa, that's so jarringly mean. Yeah, it was pretty mean of Elwood Blues. Yeah, know. wow, Elwood, what a, what a dick. This just is not. This film just did not carry the charm no. of the first one. And how could it? You and, know, and the feel like the first one had. It, it just was perfect. I love the homages to Chicago in the first one. It just, it just did not have the things that I. Loved. What What did you think about Daryl Hammond as the updated Illinois Nazis? Yeah, that was funny. I gotta say, 
if there's one thing that the Blues Brothers has been, it's prescient. <laughs> because having the Confederate boys be like the the equivalent the of Nazis boys. in this area, yeah. And if they were to do a Blues Brothers today, you just do Nazis again because that's just yep. what happened. And also, so they spent the budget on wrecking cars and definitely not wrecking boats because they had the boat scene that where the it's on top of the Blues Mobile, yeah, and it comes out of the water and then they throw a small toy boat in the air. To be fair, I was fine with that because that kind of felt like it was a, an homage and reference to Do you think? the Nazi police car that okay. was flying through the that's air fair. in the original Blues Brothers. That's fair. That, that's what I thought. Because that was pretty egregious. It was very silly, yeah. yeah. Um, but but yeah, Daryl Hammond making a, a great cameo yeah. as the, the Confederate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, proud proud boy there. It was pretty good. Um, apparently, at some point, there was hopes and discussions that Dan Aykroyd wanted to do another Blues Brothers movie where they would bring some women into the mix, the Blues Sisters, obviously. Uh, never got anything like specific or Cause, concrete cause off the, the ground. Ghostbusters, all female. It did so well. Really well. Well, this was before there was ever any backlash against women. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in the not my Ghostbusters. According to Wikipedia, in a 2023 interview, Jim Belushi stated that Aykroyd had kept pitching him several ideas for a third film, such yes. as a female-centric film. Um, but like, it's Bruce Brothers, not Bruce. And Sisters. a film where Elwood finds Jake's long lost by. A, Biological brother in Albania. Yikes. Borat. Yeah. <laughs> I like it blues. You like it, I like a music. Uh I would have I wouldn't mind seeing like Kristen Wig and Maya Rudolph. Oh, of course. Doing being the blues sisters. That yeah. would be so much fun. But this Blues Brothers needs to be funny but not slapsticky. Right. It needs to, it needs to have humor but also a a layer of levity and seriousness to it yeah. that the, I think the Blues Brothers should have. In the original, they were cool. Yeah. Like, Jake and Elwood were fucking cool. They it, were dryly funny. The half pack of cigarettes, you know, uh, spiel is is iconic for a reason. Yeah. yeah. And they were never the silly ones. They were always the straight men. Yeah. And everything around them was going crazy. This just kind of leaned into more of everything was silly. Yeah. And yeah, it just it went a little work. more slapsticky. It just yeah. it just wasn't working. No, no, not at all. Um, is there much more to say about this? Really, I mean, it's just not great. Where do you put all it? All right, let's break where, down yeah. each individual song. <laughs> <laughs> where do you no. put this? Is this better or worse than Stuart Saves His Family? So here's here's the problem with this for me in ranking this. If you again, you look at it one of two ways. Either this is a, this is an amalgamation of songs, mm-hmm. and who cares about the movie? Because that's what the intention was: was let's just get this on record. Mm-hmm. I respect the movie for that, for yeah. trying to do that. But holy shit, man! Again, I it's not a great loud, movie. Make make a documentary then, yeah. Because if we have to take this as a movie, this is by far near the bottom. Yeah, um, I think it's probably worse than Stuart Saves His Family. It is. It is worse. Uh, it's definitely better I'm, than. I've the- actually become a defender of Stuart Saves His Family. It's better than it's Pat. I think it's Pat is the bottom. Yeah, yep. it has to be. Yep, and then is. this is probably next up. Yeah, I think so because I like a night at the Roxbury better. No, I, I do too. I mean, uh, I, I laughed. I laughed. That's more. not great. Shut um, up, Nate. But oh, come on! You think that the Blues Brothers two thousand is better than Night at the Roxbury? I, even you have to say no. To I that. didn't like a night at the Roxbury. Nate, here's Wait, the thing. okay. No, hold on, Brad. Which one is it then? Which is worse? Yeah, make a choice. You can't just kind of hem and haw. Yeah, stand by your your opinions. You have said okay, you have no, said yes or no. Blues Brothers two thousand, you like as a film. I didn't say I liked it. I said it was better than I remembered because I remember it being a complete disaster. But I think that since I've seen it, I've grown to appreciate aspects of. But you films. also like A Night of the Roxbury, which. But I've acknowledged that A Night of the Roxbury is not a good movie, but I love it. Nate's doing that thing where he just asks you a question and you like to talk about yourself so much that he thinks he's going to get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> so which one's which better? Which one's worse? That's the nice thing about Brad is if I ask him. I questions. know I'm not going to let you deflect, mother. <laughs> Come on. Uh, I will say, golly, which is the worst? All right, I'll go with Blues, Bruce Brothers 2000 is the worst film. Yeah. Okay. So Nate Knox, Defender of Night of the Roxbury. Yeah, exactly. Golly. <laughs> but that Night of the Roxbury is so bad. So I bad. know, I know. It's awful. So what's the what's our updated rankings then? So uh, at the bottom, is it's, it's Pat. Pat. Then we've got Blues, Blues Brothers 2000. 2000. Yeah. Then a Night of the Roxbury. Then Not for me. And not, Stuart saves his family for you after that. Yeah, and I, no, Stuart very, saves his family is a better film. No, no, I'm like in this, like so. Then where's Coneheads and, and Blues Brothers? I didn't love Coneheads either, so I would put Coneheads below Stuart saves his family. What the fuck is See, wrong with you? And I, I didn't, I didn't love Coneheads. I didn't. That's I didn't think preposterous. Coneheads is a good comedy. I will defend that movie. It's not. 
It is. There's a lot of fun stuff in there. It's a really good sci-fi comedy, I think. But Stuart Saves His Family has heart, and there's actually, they're doing something in that Stuart film. Stuart Saves His Family. That if you let it be the film that exactly. it wanted to be, it's not a bad film. But if no. Stuart Saves His Family wasn't- People wanted it to be a, a silly Billy Madison type of film, and it's not. If it's it wasn't a Saturday Night Live movie, it would be But that that's better. fine. It is a it is a SNL film that they tried to do something different with, and I appreciate that. And, and I thought it wasn't bad. Stuart Saves His Family is by far- the most underrated SNL comedy. That's what I'm saying. It's not bad. Because, or movie, sorry, not comedy, movie. Because yes. it's not a comedy. Right. You know, we talked about this. So as far as underrated, that's it. It's a film I would watch Blues again. Blues Brothers 2000 is absolute dog shit. So is It's Pat. But Coneheads, where do you put- I your... liked Coneheads. Yeah, Coneheads um, is above Stuart Sage's family. Do would you say that, Ben? And Coneheads, Coneheads is, is above, above and I the Rocks. I mean, Con- Stuart Sage's family is trying to say something. Coneheads is not, and I appreciate films that are so not I, d- I disagree. I think Coneheads is doing a great bit of satire regarding immigration and the mm, way government approaches yeah. it. Well, I wish they would have actually done that effectively. Wayne's, I wish that you would have picked up on it, but I guess you're not smart World, enough to do that. Wayne's World 2, uh, uh, Blues Brothers- um, you know, Coneheads and <laughs> those those three. Like, you see, Brad and I are waiting for you. Are up at, up, up at like the Clever. top, right? Like those are those are the those are the great yes SNL movies. Yep. And then the next tier down is Coneheads and and Stuart Says His Family for me. And then below that, thirty meters of shit. But and then Brad and Blues I need Brothers to know. Night at the Roxbury. You forgot. No, Night at the Roxbury is pretty bad. Right, but where is it? Is it in that second tier? tier? It's in the lowest tier. It's in the lowest tiers. No, I think it is at the bottom of the second tier. Nate, if you continue this tirade against Night at the Roxbury, it's I, a shit film. I will, I will slap you in the next week. <laughs> it is a shit film. You are shit in general. <laughs> it's a bad film, and I, I'm so sad you can't see that. I'm sorry that you can't laugh and enjoy stupid comedy. I laugh at lots of stupid comedy. What's, this is not what's one. coming up next. Hey, why is don't you go watch st- another fucking Christmas is movie, st- Nate? Is it Superstar? I would love to. Superstar is actually next. Okay, yes, so that, that is the next Saturday Night Live movie. And Rainy. then the ladies, man. Dear God, why are we doing this to ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> Nate's just really mad now. I believe Superstar came out in 1999, yeah. as did The Ladies Man. Okay. There's a chance Ladies Man came out in 2000, but I think it's 19. 19- and then we at least got. And that is it? Uh, no. <laughs> are we done? No. Then we got MacGruber. Yep. MacGruber. And then are we going to do Please Don't Destroy the Yeah, treasure? we're absolutely going to do Please Don't Destroy. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies Man did come you? out in 2000. So. We should probably do Hot Rod too, just in case. Uh, well, so actually, we'll. But in fact, just watch Hot Rod for the first time today. <gasps> Whoa! Oh! We're going to talk about it on Go Flicks. You've never seen Hot Rod before? We're going to talk about it on Go Flicks. Oh my God, my people just got a little excited. It's a Saturday Night Live podcast. So you can talk a little bit about it right now. Because it's, it's mainly but, the guys but, from but SNL. Also, but also save it because I, I, I've i been thinking about this. We should watch it. I do think that we'll circle back to the Lonely Island movies because even though the, they're not official SNL movies, they were produced by Lauren Michaels. And they're, I mean, come on. And they're, produ- and they're, they're made, made by like, the Lonely SNL Island. people. Yeah. yeah and, they and they have a bunch SNL of SNL people. people. So yeah. And I do think that eventually Pop once star, we'll, we'll, we'll circle around to some of the other movies that SNL people made that aren't mm. necessarily officially SNL movies, but like So I Married an Axe Murderer, yep. Austin but Powers. But they're just filled with SNL people. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. But we'll talk about that master, at a later time. Master of Disguise. <laughs> yeah, actually, yes. <laughs> not, <laughs> not joking. <laughs> um, but so uh, I don't know if you know this, Brad, but in that movie, he plays a man that looks like a turtle. Oh, how does that turn out? Very poorly. <laughs> so if we go with some of the, the films that Lorne Michaels produced, right, so he was involved with, we would include Tommy Boy, Black Sheep. Um, yeah. Let's see. We're allowed to do anything we want, guys. Mean Girls. It's our podcast. Would Mean Girls be included in that? Because that's a Tina Fey film. That one starts to transcend a little bit because it's more of like- It's a, got Tim Meadows a, in it. An it's era. Got, it's, no, it's definitely a Saturday Night Live adjacent to a certain should, extent. Should the movies that we're doing have at least three cast members from Saturday Night Live in it? Well, that I feel like they at need to be like- three? I feel like they need to be the lead. Well, oh, okay, I mean, that okay. one would because that's got Tina Fey, Tim Meadows, and Amy but, Poehler, and a Goss Dyer. But they're not in the lead. I mean, they're pretty- Five timer Lindsay Lohan is the four timer Lindsay Lohan is though. That's I mean that's a good point. Uh, mean Girls might be just on the cusp. I don't know. What, How what, about it, Baby it Mama? One of those, yeah. Baby, because they're in the lead. And Steve Martin. Baby mm-hmm. Mama's on there. He actually did uh, he produce it? He produced well, that. See, there well, you now go. We, now so we I'll go to. through that. So Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, Steve was, Martin. Was Greg Kinnear in SNL? I feel like he may have. I think he's like hosted maybe once. Okay, um, probably around the time as good as it gets came out. Steve maybe. Martin, uh, Will Forte's in that. Fred Armisen's or what, in that. What's the other one? Dear God. Yes. Is that the one where what, where he's interrupting the the mail that's meant for God and just doing the miracles in him? I don't know if it's called Dear God. It's uh, it's called Letters from Heaven. Maybe 
I think it's called Dear God because it's like maybe it is the, the people write to God, and then he's a he's a, a postal worker that is, just opens the mail and just decides to start doing nice things for those people. You might be right. Um, but one of the things that we are definitely going to do uh, relatively soon, here, especially now that. The Lonely Island and Seth Meyers have their own podcast, which I will say, if you have not listened to and you are an SNL fan like we are, because if you're listening to this, obviously you are, uh, you should be listening to that podcast uh, as soon as possible because it is a great dive into the SNL digital shorts era and also getting a different perspective behind the scenes from Seth Meyers about that era in general because it was when Seth Meyers was just starting to blossom into being the show's head writer and you really they really talk about some of the forgotten sketches, some of the stuff that got cut. It's just a real... What it's like to be a cast member. Yeah, a real deep dive into the chaos and like the, the fun and the memories they have of working at that Another time. one Staten Island Summer. And it is called Dear God. You're right, Ben. Thank uh, you. Staten Island Summer, written by Colin Joe, starring Bobby Moynihan, Michael Bryan, Will Forte, Fred Armisen. Oh, I was trying Sarah to wrap C. up the podcast, Strong. Nate, but you want to go back to the list of That's another one we got to do. Yep. Um, but uh, one thing we're going to do here, uh, and I think before there's uh, a big change for me in my life, is uh, we're all going to sit down and we're going to watch every single SNL digital short, and we are going to rank them. And come up with a top all one hundred and fifteen of I them. I think yes, that's true. And there uh, are a lot. There are. It, it'll take a few hours, but we'll have fun. <laughs> a few hours. We're gonna set aside a time where we're, we're all gonna watch them together, and we're gonna rank them, and then we're gonna figure out what the top twenty are. I wish you could see Nate and my <laughs> fucking face right now. Like, this is a surprise that I don't want. Nate, <laughs> Nate, hey, guess what? If you can sit down and you can binge a show, you can watch the SNL Digital Shorts. And hey, Ben, if you can take a fucking nap instead of watching your assigned movie for our other podcast, you can sit down and watch SNL Digital Shorts. I think that you're underestimating how many hours. I'm not actually, because I, I, cause you know why? Some of these SNL Digital Shorts are barely two minutes long. Yeah, but we don't do anything quickly. Hey, you don't do anything quickly because you're old. This is turning into Go Flix Yourself. Which is really turned into... That's what happens when Nate brings his shitty opinions to my show. He doesn't have shitty opinions. Oh, he doesn't have a shitty opinion? Oh, none of the Roxbury is worse than Stuart saves his family. It, it, to be it, fair. That's, that's a true and accurate statement. Guys, thanks for coming to Go... Uh, <laughs> go Flix Yourself! Go you Flix Yourself! Also said it! You idiot! Thanks for coming You're to the 10 to 1 idiot. podcast, where we talk about Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live sketches, episodes, movies, and Nate's stupid opinions. <laughs> Uh, it's a fun podcast. We love when you come and listen to us. Just waste your time. <laughs> um, so what did you think about Blues Brothers 2000 audience? <laughs> I Let us a, know in the comments. <laughs> I give it a farty thumbs down. Honestly, I just want you to comment that you've either seen it or not seen it. Don't give an opinion. Or if you- Yes, I've seen the movie. That's it. No, I won't see it. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, you want to take us out? Um, the 10 to 1 podcast is sponsored by Ben Conowitz, and we really enjoy this uh, time together, and we hope that you're good to yourself and good to others. Bye-bye.